Hi, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here, finishing up this CHP overview of the life of Premier Joe N. Lai, one of history's great men, and in the PRC at least, one of the most beloved leaders of modern Chinese history. You're going to get about an episode and a half this time. Hope you don't mind. I'm only going to charge you for a single episode. We left off last time with the tragic story of Sun Wei Shi, Zhou Enlai's adopted daughter who died at the hands of a vengeful Jiang Qing. You see, Mao may have thrown cold water on the Red Guards after they spiraled out of control and after they had served their purpose for Mao, but the terror continued. There were still campaigns like cleansing the class ranks and the three loyalties and four boundless loves. In the former, over 36 million people got persecuted, and anywhere between 750,000 and a million and a half were killed, many by their own hand. The Red Guards were Jiang Qing's chief power base, so when Mao said they should all disband, and one by one they got sent down to the countryside, Jiang Qing sort of lost her primary weapon of terror and authority. The chief criticism I hear directed against Zhou Enlai was that he too willingly gave in to Mao's whims and never tried to organize any opposition to Mao. The historical record is quite clear. and From 1966 to 1969, Zhou Enlai waved that little red book as enthusiastically as the next believer. He led rallies, made appearances with radicals, and exhibited nothing but the most fervent support for the Cultural Revolution. To have done otherwise? Well, who knows? Zhou Enlai always followed Mao, and no matter if he was disposing of an old comrade or making a major speech, he always did the right thing. That's what Mao liked about Zhou. He was very stable and reliable, going back to the 1930s. Inside, Mao knew Zhou was lip-syncing to all the propaganda, but as long as he outwardly showed the utmost loyalty and support, Mao didn't make any moves against him. If Jiang Qing, Lin Piao, or any other high-ranking somebody wanted to take Zhou Enlai down, they had to get Mao's initials on the permission slip. But Mao had a very complex relationship with Zhou. First of all, Zhou Enlai, if you can say nothing else about him, was very good at his job. As premier, he was in charge of the whole state government operation. Mao knew that if he let Zhou Enlai get plowed under in the course of the Cultural Revolution... It wouldn't have been good for China, and in the end, not good for him. Though Mao's heart lay in the leftist camp, his better judgment always got the best of him when it came to leading the state, or at the very worst, staving off China's economic collapse and financial ruin. Zhou Enlai may have shed the foreign minister title, but he was still very hands-on and met with foreign leaders and dignitaries passing through China. Chen Yi, the one who took over as foreign minister in 1958, wound up on the wrong side of the Cultural Revolution. So Zhou, once again, was wearing that unofficial foreign minister's mantle. In the cities, towns, and villages, and the factories, the military, all the ministries, government offices, and of course within the CCP itself, by 1969, pretty much everyone who had something to hide as far as falling short of the standards of the leftists went. They had already been mowed down. Joe had the dubious honor of, well, having to be the one to most vociferously declare the Cultural Revolution a great success, and at the same time clean up all the wreckage left in its wake. Mao set this huge brush fire that engulfed the entire nation, and then he appointed Premier Zhou and Jiang Qing to manage it. From 1966, when it all started, and all the way through to the end, it was an epic power struggle between those two with regard to management of the Cultural Revolution and the direction the country would take. The dynamic in 1969, yeah, Mao was 76 and he wasn't too healthy but could still get around. Joe was 71, he suffered from a number of ailments and had a bad heart condition. But all in all, he still had a spring in his step. In his robust but ultimately unsuccessful defense of Chen Yi, he had suffered a serious heart attack. He survived it okay, but that would all change. Jiang Qing in 1969 was a very active and energetic 55 years old. Mao around this time was really into the whole world communist unite thing and spreading revolution and, well, spreading his ideology, Mao Zedong thought, around the world. He styled himself as the one remaining legit 
revolutionary that stayed true to the Marxist-Leninist cause, as tarnished as the ideology may have gotten by 1969. Mao's idea about continuous revolution had gotten written into the party constitution that came out of the Ninth Party Congress. This was the CCP Congress that turned out like more of a Red Guard rally than anything. This was the meeting where the leftists got to take their victory lap. Liu Xiaoqi, Deng, and all Zhou's closest allies were out. Liu would die in agony on his jail cell floor later in the same year. Thankfully, Mao Zedong wasn't prepared to let China go totally down the drain, the direction it was heading around this time. If there was no Chinese state, then Mao lost his legitimacy. So for this... He always made sure Zhou was protected. But between 1969 and the day Premier Zhou passed away in 1976, it was the most airtight, full-court press that you can imagine. Every day until he passed, Zhou was living under a microscope. Every utterance he made or document he signed, his enemies picked through, sniffed, weighed, always looking for something, anything that they could run to Mao with that might diminish Joe and create mistrust between the chairman and his number three. But when Richard Nixon began reaching out as soon as he sat down in the Oval Office in early 1969, Mao was quite excited about this. Establishing relations with the U.S. was a very big priority for Mao. He may have been railing against the American imperialists and leading the chairs about how rotten America was, But aside from that, given the Russian situation and making friends from far away to put the squeeze on those who are close by, plus all the other potential perks, Mao responded positively to Nixon's overtures made through back channels that had been established by Joe during the good old days in 1954 following the Geneva Conference. Perfect timing as far as Mao was concerned. The military confrontations along the Usuri River in March of that fateful year, 1969, on the Sino-Soviet border, and later on in Xinjiang as well, had pushed the needle about as far as it could go in the direction of bad relations with the Russians. The USA had always been a nice prop for Mao during the Cultural Revolution. Now he had a different use for Uncle Sam and his ideological struggle with the Soviets. Mao naturally put Joe in charge of this USA project. And because this was important to Mao, Jiang Qing couldn't go against it. Same with Lin Biao. They were both dead set against this whole Nixon thing. Nothing good could possibly come out of this for either of them. But it went ahead, 1969, 1970, and finally into 1971, things hotted up. Joe managed the whole affair, all messages being secretly passed back and forth through mutual friends, because there were no direct relations between China and the U.S., ended up being read and answered personally by Joe. Henry Kissinger secretly flew from Pakistan to Beijing to hold direct talks with Joe on February 9th and 10th. This was in 1971. Kissinger's visit put into motion a concatenation of events that led to Richard Nixon's dramatic visit to China, the great handshake photo with Zhou Enlai and Chairman Mao, and the Shanghai communique, signed during the week that changed the world, February 21st to 27th, 1972. Besides the matter of Taiwan, the other main topic of discussion was the Vietnam War. Although aid to the Viet Cong from China was affected by the chaos created by the Cultural Revolution, it continued to flow, and the management of China's involvement was, and had always been, Joe's responsibility. By 1971, China's aid to Vietnam was at its highest level. Joe knew the U.S. was trying to get out of Vietnam. It wouldn't be such a bad thing if it ended for China, too. The drain on the Treasury was terrible. But Joe was firm, no U.S. puppet states allowed on China's borders. I covered Nixon's visit to China before in one of those ancient episodes from 2010. That was a uh, two-parter, CHP 8 and 9. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over all the details of Nixon's China visit and what an absolute superstar Joe Enlai was in front of the world press. But I do encourage you to go listen to those two CHP episodes if you haven't already. But before Richard Milhouse Nixon walked down those steps of Air Force One and shook Zhou Enlai's hand, there was plenty of action going on in and around Chung Nan High. 1969 was a year of many things, one of which was 
dissent in the ranks of the leftists, Jiang Qing's people. Maybe with all perceived enemies, either dead, in prison, disgraced, or disabled, there was no one else to turn on. Therefore, the radical leftists began turning on each other. The first big boom was when longtime Jiang Qing supporter Chen Da broke with the Cultural Revolution Group and became a client of Lin Biao. Lin was politically not allied with Zhang Chunqiao and Yao Wenyuan, and by extension, Jiang Qing. From 1966 to 1968, Jiang Qing and Lin Biao had been forced to remain strange bedfellows. Like everyone else, Lin couldn't stand Jiang Qing. This political dynamic gave Zhou some degree of wiggle room, and he manipulated events, people's egos, frustrations, and whatever else he had to do to maintain order and keep all balls in the air. But then came Lin Biao's fatal error at the plenum held at Lushan in August-September 1970, following the Ninth Party Congress. Lushan again, where the Yangtze River meets Poyang Lake in Jiangxi Province. That used to be uh, Jiang Kai-shek's summer retreat back in the day. In June 1937, Zhou Enlai sat with Jiang Kai-shek at Lushan half a year after the kidnapping, the Xi'an incident, and discussed strategy with the Generalissimo and their united front against the Japanese invaders. George Marshall had come to Lushan after the war to discuss China's role in the post-war New World Order. In 1959 at Lushan, Mao had unjustly purged Peng De Huai for daring to speak out against the disastrous Great Leap Forward. In August, September 1970 came another historic showdown in beautiful scenic Mount Lu. This was the second plenum of the Ninth Central Committee. Lin Biao was Mao's heir presumptive, and if things went as planned, when Mao died, Lin would wield supreme power. Too bad for Lin that Jiang Qing also had her sights on the same exact supreme power. Lin began to lose favor with Mao around the time he began lobbying for the state chairman position, left open since the fall of Liu Shaoqi. Mao perhaps saw that Lin had stacked the PLA with his men. Of the three existing factions, that is, Jiang Qing and her CCRG radical followers, uh, Lin Biao in the military, and Zhou Enlai, Lin was the most powerful. Mao's old comrades were all out. Lin had seen to that, and Mao had allowed it all to happen. But now... Ma was getting the sneaking suspicion that Lin was going to make a power grab. Eh, there's two ways historians look at this. One way is that it was a power grab by Lin. The other was that Lin was just doing all he could to defend himself. Being Mao's number two wasn't all it was cut out to be, as Lin will find out. Joe had no problem reading the tea leaves, and he saw what loomed ahead. He did his best to stay out of this conflict and stuck to the tried-and-true formula of trying to please Mao. He stayed on the sidelines while this epic battle started shaping up. If Zhou had to choose sides, his sympathies lied more with Lin Biao than Jiang Qing, but he knew better than to get involved in that showdown. Zhou also went out of his way not to pick any fights with Jiang Qing and not to allow her to get the best of him. She baited him constantly, showered him with scorn, and in front of everyone, openly and aggressively challenged and disrespected him. Joe had to put up with it. He had no choice. She was Mao's wife, often his proxy, and his chief weapon of destruction. Well, Mao chose this plenum at Lu Shan to let everyone know how he felt about Lin Biao wanting the state president position. He used the whole matter of who should be the next state president as his means of making his opening moves against Lin. Mao thought the position, a ceremonial one, should just be left vacant. Liu Shaoqi used to hold it, but now that he was purged, there was no need to fill it. Lin Biao, for some reason, was unable or was just unwilling to read the tea leaves because when Mao made his position known, Lin kept pushing. Just like several years ago when Mao wanted to take a swipe at Liu Shaoqi, he went after Peng Zhen, one of Liu's men. Now at this meeting, Mao lashed out violently at his former secretary Chen Da, the turncoat leftist who had switched camps, abandoning Jiang Qing for Lin Biao. Back in 1959, Mao had used Chen Da to destroy Peng Dehuai. Now it was Chen's turn to feel what that was like. 
And for Lin Biao, too, he began to find out the hard way what Liu Xiaoqi had gone through. For Zhou Enlai, this was quite a blessing to counter Lin Biao's influence. Mao gave Zhou the okay to start bringing back many old cadres who had been thrown under the bus the past few years. These were mostly all casualties of Lin Biao and his efforts to consolidate power. For the remainder of 1970 until September 1971, Lin Biao had to watch his whole life get deconstructed in slow motion. Mao, too, any way you look at it, getting rid of Lin Biao made him look bad. The obvious reasons were Lin was his chosen successor, and Lin had been the producer of the whole Mao cult in the Little Red Book. Now Mao gets rid of him? That didn't look good. For Mao Zedong, there wasn't a lot of time left on the clock, and this latest turn of events reflected poorly on the Cultural Revolution, and therefore, on his legacy. Damn Khrushchev and the 1956 secret speech. Never did Mao think that ending up like Stalin was more possible than now. Despite his unwavering loyalty, Mao didn't trust that Zhou would preserve his legacy. Lin was on his way out. As far as Mao resting easy that no one would revise the history books and make him look bad, there was only Jiang Qing and her faction of leftist radical followers. Mao knew his best shot was with them. The only problem was that, while this group was masterful at smashing things up and wrecking people's lives, they were terrible at managing the levers of government, administration, and commerce. Time and again, whenever leftists seized power, things descended into chaos and terrible societal disruption. So Mao's strategy was to force Zhou Enlai and Jiang Qing to work together. Those two who so openly despised and hated each other, under this forced arrangement, she became a handicap to Zhou until the hour he died. But just like he had to do when the Great Leap Forward ended, Zhou had to take charge and make everything look completely normal and that Lin's fall from grace had nothing to do with the success and greatness of the Cultural Revolution. While Zhou managed this, he was heavily involved in bringing back many of the more capable technocrats and conservatives who were put back in power and worked tirelessly to get China's engine going again, just as it started to sputter. Yeah, end of 1970, early 1971, as usual, Premier Zhou had his hands full, managing the fate of the country's recovery domestically and internationally, American detente, the Vietnam War, the Soviets, not to mention the future of the CCP, nothing too big. He had another heart attack during this period, but as far as Zhou's health went, the worst was still yet to come. In the midst of all the ongoing discussions with the Americans, Zhou also handled the matter of the invitation of the U.S. ping-pong team to China. This was all Zhou Enlai, political theater at its best. I read the whole thing was a setup. Luring Glenn Cowan onto the Chinese team bus, Zhuang Zedong asking him if he wanted to play in China, making sure the press assembled in Nagoya that day witnessed the whole thing. Whatever the case may be, on April 6, 1971, the U.S. team was in Japan for the World Table Tennis Championships. Before you could say the words ping-pong diplomacy, on April 10th, the first group of Americans since 1949 were formally allowed into the PRC. On the 14th, Joe met with these American players and laid the schmaltz on nice and thick. Setting this whole thing up and pulling it off as smoothly as he did really did a lot to juice up the ongoing U.S.-China talks going on quietly behind the scenes. Later that same month, with this air of inevitability, Joe sent a message to Nixon via the Pakistanis that China was ready to receive Nixon's envoy to discuss Taiwan and other matters of mutual interest. Edgar Snow had interviewed Chairman Mao on December 18, 1970, and Life magazine carried the interview in their end-of-April issue. In the interview, Mao said it was okay for Nixon to come to China, either as a tourist or president. While all this was going on, Zhou also had to carefully manage the Mao-Lin Biao struggle. Lin had fallen into Mao's trap from which there was no escape. Joe tried to talk some sense into Lin, but Lin wouldn't have it. For example, he suggested for the 1971 May Day rally, wouldn't it be great for the sake of showing unity if Lin showed up? Yeah, Lin ended up going, but he openly snubbed Chairman Mao. And during the rally, 
the parties number one and number two wouldn't talk to each other. Despite Joe's efforts to moderate, both sides weren't going to consider backing down. By the summer of 1971, it was getting uglier and uglier. By August, the situation for Lynn was desperate. Mao was already making moves to visit with key military leaders in the South and was obviously making sure the PLA was loyal to him first. Wherever Mao went, he would attack Lin Biao, not by name, but he used enough innuendo so that you didn't need an overabundance of brain cells to know who he was attacking. Classic Mao, closing in for the kill now. So we all know what happens. 10 p.m. on the night of September 12th, Zhou Enlai was working late at the Great Hall of the People, and he got a call from Lin Biao's daughter, who got wind of what was going down with Lin's ill-fated plan. The whole thing sounded too far out to believe, but Joe made a few calls and learned this was really happening. When he called Wu Fa Xian, one of Lin's closest allies in the military, he knew something was up. Joe sprang into action, and for the entirety of the Lin Biao incident that went down the evening of September 12th and 13th, 1971, he was the one in the middle of it. Lin and his party, which included his wife, Ye Chun, and his son, Lin Li Guo, were at the CCP leadership compound at Bei Dai He. The Trident aircraft that Lin was planning to use to make his escape was parked about an hour's drive north at Shanghai Guan Airport. Shanghai Guan, of course, the location where the Great Wall begins. When Zhou told Mao what was going on, it appeared that Mao already knew about Lin's plan. He told Joe to stand down and wait to see how this played out. Joe was in touch with Ye Chun and let her know that he knew what was going on, and so did Chairman Mao. And he advised her to talk some sense to her husband and to give up. Just as George Bush did immediately following the 9-11 attacks, Joe ordered all planes in China grounded. He called for Mao to be bundled up and taken to a bunker safely underground beneath the Great Hall of the People. Supposedly around midnight, eh, what really happened may never be known, the 8341 Palace Guards were closing in on the jet parked at Shanghai Guan Airport. As the legend goes, there wasn't enough time to gas up the plane, and it went barreling down the runway before they could be stopped. And a little under two hours later, the plane had crossed over into Mongolian airspace. Joe called Mao and asked for permission to shoot the plane down with a missile. With a vice chairman of the party on board, only Mao could make that call. According to some accounts, Mao replied to Zhou, Tian yao xia yu, niang yao jia ren, wu fa ke she, you ta chu ba, which means the heavens must rain and a woman wants to be wed. Nothing can be done about this. Let him go. And legend has it, sometime in the middle of the night, Lin's plane ran out of fuel and crashed in eastern Mongolia in a town whose name I dare not try to pronounce. This was a long night for Joe, and the amount of damage control that needed to be done was considerable. It was time once again for Joe to protect Mao's face and find some way to stabilize things. As he did following the Great Leap, Joe devised a way to spin the whole Lin Biao incident into something that didn't reflect poorly on Mao Zedong. At this dark hour in party history... Joe became the communications pipeline between Mao, the leaders, and the military. Joe called an emergency meeting of the Politburo and told everyone what happened. Next, he put the military on high alert for a possible Soviet attack. If there was ever a moment when China was vulnerable and ripe for attack, you know, the aftermath of the Lin Biao incident was a good time. The next day, on September 14th, the PRC embassy in Mongolia confirmed that Lin's plane had indeed crashed in Mongolia. So once again, the number two position in the CCP hierarchy was vacated, and Zhou Enlai, ranked third, sort of became the next in line to the Communist Party version of the Dragon Throne. And yeah, no one knew better than Zhou what a terrible spot this was to be in. This reflected terribly on Mao. He was really devastated. The chairman had allowed Lin Biao to whack all his most trusted and loyal comrades, all these old marshals who had led the PLA to victory over the nationalists were living in disgrace, all victims of the Cultural Revolution. Mao had sat back and watched them get savaged by the leftists. 
As they sank, Lin Biao rose, along with all his cronies. Now this happened, and you can imagine how uncomfortable it must have been for Mao. That's why, a few months later, when Chen Yi died, Mao used this opportunity to try and patch things up with his old comrades. In January 1972, Mao was 78 years old and now starting to show obvious signs that you know, he could go at any time. Normally for a sick old man like this, and being Chairman Mao and all, Chun Yi's funeral you know, wouldn't be an occasion that he would rise from his bed to attend. But Mao had a lot of making up to do, and he ordered his aides and attendants to get him ready and take him to Chun Yi's funeral at Ba Bao Shan. As soon as Joe got word of this, being chief of choreography in these cases, he completely changed the funeral proceedings. The pomp and ceremony of these kinds of occasions were, you know, determined by whether Mao went or not. When Mao showed up, which was not often, things had to be done a little differently. It was a bitterly cold January day in Beijing when Mao arrived at the funeral ceremony. He was still clad in his pajamas and was not in good shape, nor was he looking too good. But everyone knew the symbolism behind the moment. Ma was extending an olive branch to all those old comrades who he had pretty much forsaken. But with Lin Biao going out in the kind of style he did, he turned himself into the ultimate scapegoat. And right there at Chen Yi's funeral, Mao pointed at Lin Biao's ghost and said he was to blame for all the suffering endured by Chen Yi. That sure was a harbinger of things to come. For just about anything that needed to be spun in the right direction, Lin made the perfect fall guy. Mao ended up paying a price, though, for attending Chen Yi's funeral in the form of pneumonia he caught, followed by a pulmonary heart condition to add to his physical woes. The chairman's condition became even more fragile than ever before. It was most certainly a testament to the abilities and skills of Mao's doctors that he managed to hang in there for almost five more years. Mao wasn't ready to meet Marx just yet. He recovered from this shock to his system and to the party, and when he was back to his old self again, he began to attend meetings and get back into the swing of things. This is when Zhou Enlai realized that he was becoming Mao's next target. If Mao had died, in all probability, with no successor waiting in the wings, Zhou Enlai would have been made the de facto leader of the party. Mao knew, despite all their power, Jiang Qing and the leftists did not have the relationships within the military and the government that Zhou had, and that they'd be taken down easy. Therefore, and for the remainder of Zhou Enlai's days, he wore a target on his back, and Chairman Mao aimed for it all the time, and his instrument was, of course, Jiang Qing. A lot of good Joe's loyalty had done him. Going back 37 years to the Zunyi Conference in 1935, Joe had watched Mao's back, and at every moment when Mao was vulnerable, Joe had been there to help him get past the moment. Against his better judgment, Zhou Enlai had carried out Mao's will, going back to the anti-rightist campaign, the Great Leap Forward, the Third Front, and during the horrific disaster that became the Cultural Revolution. In the end, however, it was all for naught. There was no reward for Premier Zhou Enlai, no happy ending, nothing that could be construed as positive payback for all the loyalty he showed the chairman. It would have been nice for Joe if Chairman Mao had simply left him alone to do his job and clean up the destruction wrought by the Cultural Revolution. But that wasn't meant to be. In his last years, Mao grew to really dislike Joe. And in his dying years, Mao was able to cause his premier the worst form of physical pain topped with copious amounts of mental anguish. That was Joe's reward for almost four decades of loyalty to Mao and loyalty to the party and service to China. Three months after Nixon came and went in February 1972, Zhou Enlai was diagnosed with bladder cancer. His doctors recommended a treatment that offered about an 80 to 90 percent chance of recovery. But there was this strange rule in the world of Zhongnan Hai for standing committee members, and I think this extended to anyone in the Politburo as well, Chairman Mao had to sign off on all medical treatments. When told of Joe's malady, Mao's instructions were to keep the extent of the seriousness a secret. 
Both the premier and Deng Yingchao were not to be told. Mao also instructed that there be no further exams carried out and no surgery. The record is pretty clear that Mao denied the treatment that might have saved Zhou. So while the cancer began to build a life for itself inside Zhou Enlai's body, not only was treatment denied, Zhou had found himself under all kinds of scrutiny and borderline persecution for things that had happened decades before that Jiang Qing and her team had been able to dig up using their own version of Wu Mao's everywhere. All kinds of petty BS things from long ago that were questionable at best were waved in front of Joe as if he had sold the country and the party down the river. Yeah, by 1972-73, Mao knew it was going to be a race to the finish between him and Joe and Lai as far as who outlived the other. And Mao was determined to rattle his premier's cage to the great man's dying day. And Mao became obsessed that he outlived Joe. That was necessary at all costs. Mao was making all this noise and subjecting Zhou to endless hostile criticism in order to get him to openly say the magic words that he, Zhou Enlai, was not going to be Mao's successor. So Zhou dutifully let these words ring out in a major speech. Quote, it is absolutely necessary and practical for me, a man who has committed serious mistakes in the struggles over party line, to discuss the six previous such struggles. I always thought and will always think that I cannot be at the helm and can only be an assistant. When you are all made aware of my historical mistakes, you will be able to break with superstitions. And in this spirit, you have the right to make sure that I undergo the necessary reform. And if I fail to carry out this reform and end up committing even bigger mistakes, then you certainly have the right to request that the party center engage in a lengthy discussion. But for more serious transgressions, I should be deprived of all my formal positions. This is party life, as established by Chairman Mao. End quote. Well, this should have satisfied Mao. With those words spoken, unless Joe's supporters physically picked him up and plopped him on the throne, he had disqualified himself from being chosen or even presuming to be Mao's successor or even worthy and suitable for the party chairmanship. Joe sidestepped Mao with those words. I'm sure even Joe himself didn't want or even need to take over in the event of Mao's death. Well, as things turned out, it was a moot point anyway. So for the time being, for Mao to further make Joe's life miserable because of the succession reason, it was simply to go on beating a dead horse. Joe made it clear he was neither worthy, suitable, nor capable. Case closed. Eh, there was something else, and man, did this ever make Chairman Mao unhappy. After the Nixon visit, it was like Joe and Lai became George Michael and Mao became Andrew Ridgely. The world press, major political leaders, celebrities, major people. It seemed since Nixon left, Joe had become this global phenomenon. And no one was saying how cool and great Chairman Mao was. All this shine that Joe received in the wake of the week that changed the world really rubbed Mao the wrong way and added to his suspicions about Joe. Jiang Qing and her coterie began making all kinds of noise about how Zhou Enlai gave everything away to the Americans and how he poorly managed the relationship with the Soviets. They said anything they could think of that could diminish Zhou's achievement. And naturally, Mao didn't stop her. These days, 1972, 73, and basically until the end came, Mao was living like the hermit of Peking. Two women had pretty much almost exclusive access to Mao. One was his grandniece, Wang Hai Rong, and the other was Nancy Tang Wen Sheng. Wang Hai Rong's role was to keep her uncle well informed of everything Zhou did, said, or wrote down. Mao never kept a closer eye on Zhou than he did now. In the face of what was obviously another huge, costly blunder by Chairman Mao, two in a row, I might add, if you... Don't figure the third front into the mix. The Cultural Revolution seemed destined to be judged by the party as a mistake. With Mao believing the Cultural Revolution to be his greatest legacy, a lot of his attention went into preserving this. That's how Wang Hongwen later got helicoptered into the lofty stratosphere of Zhongnanhai politics. The legacy of the Cultural Revolution became Mao's last and final obsession. As Jiang Qing wailed on about Zhou loudly, forcefully, disrespectfully at Politburo meetings about that capitulationist 
document he worked out called the Shanghai Communique and his alleged bungling of Soviet relations. Joe had to fall back into survival mode. This was old hat many years ago, but now, after so many heart attacks and now stricken with cancer, it wasn't as easy as it used to be. and sapped his strength more easily. The Paris Peace Accords that ended the Vietnam War, well, sort of, that, that Joe had such a major hand in, were signed on January 27, 1973. Even amidst this storm and fight for political survival, Joe never let up in his thankless role as premier and foreign minister. Later on, years after the fall of the Gang of Four, when Jiang Qing was getting her comeuppance at her trial, she famously said that she was Mao's dog, and when he told her to bite, she bit. Well, starting around 1973, Mao took the leash off and allowed Jiang Qing to go after Zhou Enlai and bite him till her heart's content. This is the time when the core group that surrounded Jiang Qing came to be known as the Gang of Four. Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunxiao, Yao Wenyuan, and young Wang Hongwen, Mao's heir presumptive since he was elevated to vice chairman status at the 10th Party Congress. Also around this time, Mao made a call to the Xinjian County Tractor Factory near Nanchang, Jiangxi Province, and told him to send Deng Xiaoping back to the capital. Deng had been laying low there since 1969. Despite his fall from grace, Mao had always he had a pretty good feeling as far as Deng Xiaoping's personal loyal to him went. Deng had supported Mao back in the 30s at some key moments that had not been forgotten by the chairman. Mao's intention was to use Deng as a lever to counter Zhou in the government and to act as the tip of the spear to lead the criticism against Zhou Enlai. To bring Deng back at this time was a wise move. Besides, being quite capable and experienced, Deng had up till now been loyal to Mao, so bringing him back was a kind of test of his continued loyalty. A test that, of course, we all know Deng Xiaoping will fail. Jiang Qing was outraged. She hated Deng from way back when. Those two never had any patience for each other. Zhou knew how to handle her and keep her as benign as possible. And when that wasn't possible and she was at her worst, hurling insults and trying to browbeat Joe into submission, Joe had the patience to sit back and endure it. Joe knew no matter what, as long as Mao wanted him alive, Jiang Qing couldn't do anything except blow smoke and call him names. But Deng, on the other hand, he was not like this. When Jiang Qing got in his face, he got right back into hers. So this bitter struggle within the inner core of the party became a fact of life. Mao wasn't doing anything to ameliorate it. He saw what Deng was doing, bringing people back from disgrace, putting things in order. This was what Zhou had always tried to do. So Mao was hoping Deng was going to do one thing, but he went and did another. Deng wasn't in the whole continuous revolution thing the same way Mao was. For Mao, it wasn't enough that they had won in 1949. They had to keep the revolution going and never stop. Deng parted ways with Mao there. Now it was time to rebuild the country. It was the lack of luster that the Cultural Revolution had taken on since the Lin Biao incident that mostly allowed Zhou and now Deng as well to begin to restore order. This began to mean that leftists who had made themselves at home in the new order had to step aside. But Mao had one last fight in him, and he wasn't going to let Zhou Enlai succeed. He was so sure that Zhou Enlai was his long-lost Khrushchev to counter Zhou and to preserve his national and revolutionary legacy after he died. Mao had to make sure the leftists were still around to fight against any attempts at revisionism. The magnitude of the nonsense that Zhou Enlai had to face in this desperate hour for China boggles the mind. The last and final campaign that Mao unleashed on Zhou was the Pilin Pikong campaign. Criticize Lin Biao, criticize Confucius campaign. This was some convoluted political smear campaign that started off as a way to reconcile Mao thought with Chinese history, but morphed into a campaign to criticize Lin Biao. Then in early 1975, when Zhou was too weak to defend himself, the campaign turned into an all-out attack on him and his allies, most notably Deng. The Pi Lin Pi Kong nonsense went on unabated until the arrest of the Gang of Four. It was a last 
desperate, twisted political campaign used by Mao and his leftist supporters to wreak some final havoc on the nation by attacking and disabling China's most capable leaders. In March 1974, Mao had sent Deng Xiaoping to represent China at the UN's sixth special session. Mao could have let Zhou have this moment, but feeling how he was, the great helmsman acted spitefully and sent Deng instead. The truth is, even if Mao had given Zhou the nod, he was too sick for such an ordeal. Maybe he could have gotten it all together to have this one last great moment on the world stage. But in any case, Zhou and Lai had to swallow his pride and sign off on the order from Mao to send Deng Xiaoping instead. That was Mao's direct order. Jiang Qing was so out of control and bold that she went off on the chairman's decision and made a big stink about allowing Deng to go. So in a rare moment of instant karma, Mao publicly chastised Jiang Qing and told her in so many words, do not challenge his decision and to be careful moving forward or else. By the time Deng Xiaoping was showing his face around the United Nations in April 1974, Zhou Enlai's cancer was now raging out of control. From this point forward, his team of doctors will be working around the clock simply to keep him alive. You know, when something could have been done, Mao wouldn't allow the doctors to save Zhou Enlai. So the cancer simply took its natural course. And now it was two years later, and this tumor on Zhou's bladder had more than enough time to metastasize and take over his life. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, unsung hero of PRC history, Ye Jianying, appealed to Mao to allow the doctors to treat the premier. He went to bat for Joe and got Mao to finally give in on this urgent matter. Much to the chagrin of the Gang of Four, Mao said it was okay to examine the premier, but no treatment. The doctors secretly treated Joe and Lai anyway, but the fact was there wasn't much they could do to save him. For the remainder of his days... Zhou Enlai's life was one of constant blood loss followed by blood transfusions. By June 1st, 1974, Zhou had his first operation, followed by a second one two months later. By the time of this August surgery, Zhou Enlai's health was in the stage where eh, he could go at any time. But he did muster up some strength following the second surgery to attend the ceremony to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, something that... Nobody could deny he had a major hand in doing. Zhou Enlai's illness was the worst-kept secret in Beijing. So when the premier slowly shuffled to the podium to speak that day, September 30th, 1974, those assembled inside the Great Hall of the People gave him an enthusiastic ovation. It went on and on, and people in the back were even standing on their chairs to participate in the moment. Everyone knew. He had been unjustly dragged through the mud throughout the entirety of the Cultural Revolution, and especially since the fall of Lin Biao. The message was clear as far as where the party faithful stood on the matter of Comrade Zhou Enlai. The following year, Zhou was too ill to attend the National Day celebrations, but by the fall of 1975, Deng Xiaoping had already taken over most of the Premier's responsibilities. When 49 formerly disgraced veterans appeared that day in the Great Hall of the People, it was a major signal that a page was turning in PRC history. It said when they wheeled out General Luo Ching, who had suffered so unjustly, Deng Yingchao left her seat to come to him and shake his hand warmly and show her respect on behalf of herself and her husband. Mao didn't attend the 25th anniversary event in 1974, but word has it he wasn't amused with the ovation Zhou got. CCTV played the whole thing down as far as the outpouring of support for Premier Zhou, and some of his remarks were edited out. Up till then, Mao was so sure he was finally going to be able to tear Zhou down. But after such a spontaneous outpouring of affection for the Premier, he couldn't very well go in for the kill now. But Zhou was dying. Mao was kept informed daily of every known aspect of the progression of Zhou's illness that he was in a constant state of horrific pain and fighting for his life meant little to Mao and even less to Jiang Qing. She would do things like call meetings and demand his attendance or you know, visit him in the hospital room that had become his office. And still she continued to berate him and pour whatever scorn she could and resist every reasonable decision he made. 
Mao wouldn't let Joe go peacefully. He, too, had his demands, one of which was for Joe to gather up enough strength to put together the Fourth National People's Congress. The third NPC was back in 1964, so this matter of the next People's Congress was way overdue. Mao had hoped that in bringing back Deng Xiaoping, he could be a kind of counterbalance to Jiang Qing's zany antics. He underestimated the disdain with which both those two held each other. Deng played on all Jiang Qing's shortcomings and wasn't intimidated at all by her when they were alone. Zhou Enlai would tell Deng to be careful, back down once in a while. He warned Deng about the probable consequences if he went too far. But this aspect of being able to make all these strategic compromises that was second nature to Zhou Enlai wasn't part of Deng's basic makeup. So it was no wonder that Deng finally got swatted down. Deng's most visible crime was the bringing back of all these old cadres and former leaders. Seven years before, most of these people were wearing dunce hats and placards describing their crimes. Now they were back in their old offices, getting in on the sudden reforms that required their expertise or experience. By 1975, there were a lot of these people clocking in at work again. And if these people were the enemies targeted by the Cultural Revolution and they were back in their old positions, well, what did that imply? By the time of the Fourth National People's Congress, Mao was stymied. He had put too much faith in Jiang Qing. She turned out to be a weapon that lacked any kind of precision. She and her followers were incompetent. And Mao looked on in agony as those who thought like Zhou Enlai made monkeys out of Jiang Qing and the leftists. Zhou had stolen the limelight again at the 4th NPC. Everyone there who watched him on that day in January 1975 knew this would most likely be his last, final, major public appearance. Indeed, this was. He wasn't able to rise from his bed too often afterwards. And this final speech... Joe proposed something that he had tried unsuccessfully to champion back in 1963. Now in 1975, with the timing being more desperate than ever, Joe and Lai proposed a project called the Four Modernizations. And everything you can see today, as far as China's great achievements in agriculture, industry, defense, and science and technology, can trace its roots to this 1975 NPC speech, Zhou Enlai's last. By mid-1975, Deng had taken things sufficiently far enough whereby Mao decided it was time to take him down. Jiang Qing baited Deng wherever, whenever, and she knew how to spin everything when she went back and reported to her husband. From a sickbed, Zhou Enlai watched Deng fall right into Mao's trap. The political climate had seemed ripe to stand up to Jiang Qing and her attempts to create trouble and sow discord. But Zhou saw what Mao was doing. It was the February countercurrent of 1967 all over again. Mao sitting back, letting everyone say whatever they wanted. Deng, of course, did not back down to Jiang Qing and said words that he maybe lived to regret later. The summer of 1975, when all this was happening, Joe was in a bad way. He didn't even weigh 80 pounds. He was attended to 24 hours a day. He tried to appeal to Mao personally in a letter to let him die in peace. But Mao just couldn't let go. The hatred, I guess, burned too deep. In Mao's last 18 months, who could tell for sure how his thought process worked? He was in his 80s sick as a dog from all kinds of cardiovascular, pulmonary, and neurological diseases. No one ever saw him except his aides. No one could predict what Mao would do with Jiang Qing and her gang being Mao's sole supplier of news and information. It wasn't a difficult task to rile the chairman and make him strike. He may have been on his last legs, but he was still Chairman Mao. Ye Jianying and Zhou both tried to talk some sense into Deng Xiaoping to not act so boldly and to give Mao some face. Deng Xiaoping, in true fashion, acted according to what he believed was right. Results from his reforms and measures were just beginning to be seen. Zhou and Marshal Ye tried to talk some sense to Deng and let him know fixing the country 
wasn't Chairman Mao's priority. Deng had won over the two ladies, Wang Hai Rong and Nancy Tang. So Mao, seeing this, got rid of them as his principal aides and go-betweens. In their place came one of the latecomers to the whole Cultural Revolution epic. This was Mao's nephew, Mao Yunxin. He became the new gatekeeper, Mao's last and final loyal assistant. Mao decided to give Deng one last and final test. He wanted Deng to publicly declare in a major speech that despite everything, the Cultural Revolution was still 70% good. This had to be uttered by Deng, and it had to be uttered in a major forum where it would go on the public record. By doing it this way, it made it difficult for anyone to backpedal later on after Mao had passed. Mao Yunxin represented his uncle at Politburo meetings and duly reported all the proceedings. The way Mao was hearing things from his nephew, Deng was continuing to challenge him. And so for this reason, Deng Xiaoping needed to be taken down. At a Politburo meeting, Jiang Qing was allowed to attack him mercilessly. Soon it became clear that Mao had abandoned him to the rage of the leftists. In November, December 1975, Deng was given his last chance to recant and agree with Mao's 70% deal. He wouldn't do it. Seeing that Deng was cruising for a bruising, Zhou had to take matters into his own hand. Mao had ignored his letter from mid-1975, offering to resign as premier and make Deng his replacement. Zhou thereupon took it upon himself to defy Mao and start passing the word around that Deng was his choice as a successor. On September 7, 1975, in his last ever meeting with a foreign delegation, this one from Romania, Joe had announced on the record that Deng had already taken over many of his day-to-day -day duties as premier and was diligently carrying out the planning of the four modernizations. Joe knew what he was doing from his hospital bed, often writhing in agony from the pain. Joe got the word out in the global press. Deng was his successor, and China was sticking with the four modernizations. Joe believed this would preempt any attempt by Mao to derail Deng and the whole in mid-September, Joe had his fourth operation. Let me recount what one of uh, Joe's doctors witnessed. I'm lifting this quote from Gao Wenqian's book, Zhou Enlai, The Last Perfect Revolutionary. Quote, Wheeled up to the operating room, Joe suddenly turned his head to the right and said in a heavy but low, hushed voice, Where is Comrade Xiaoping? Please ask him to come here. I immediately passed the word back. Comrade Xiaoping, the premier has requested your presence. Deng hurried to be next to the premier, who took his trembling hand and voice shaking with emotion, shouted out for all to hear. Comrade Xiaoping, your work over the years has shown that you are truly tougher than I am. Deng was overwhelmed with emotion when he heard this accolade from the premier, and with great solemnity, he shook Joe's hand as firmly as he could, standing there without saying a word. Deng then waved his hands in a salute, sending Joe off to the operating room, wishing the premier a safe journey as he wiped away his tears. End quote. It wasn't a long operation. The doctors opened up the premier and closed him up right away. There was nothing that could be done. The cancer had spread throughout his body, and it was now just a matter of months, if not weeks. As soon as Zhou Enlai breathed his last, Deng Xiaoping knew his main benefactor would be gone and he'd be left unprotected. Therefore, it was imperative to keep Zhou alive. These were Deng's instructions to the medical team. Extend his life as long as possible. Limit the pain. Zhou had the upper hand now. Zhou had in his dying days, if the two speeches he gave in 74 and 75 were any indication, had quite a sky-high public approval rating. Therefore, the remaining months of Zhou's life were spent using all his political capital to try to protect Deng Xiaoping. Except there wasn't much Zhou could do anymore. He hadn't left his bed since October 75. He was in and out of consciousness, always racked with the most unbearable pain and suffering that cancer had to offer. Every waking hour was a struggle. It said that Zhou, in order to remain as clear-headed as possible at such a desperate hour for Deng Xiaoping, would often refuse painkillers. But as the year 1975 began to wind down, Deng Xiaoping was 
for all intents and purposes, on his own. As soon as it was obvious Joe was in his final days, if not hours, Ma went after Dung. And indeed, after six major surgeries and over a hundred blood transfusions, at 9.25 in the morning, January 8th, 1976, Joe and Lai's suffering finally came to an end. From the time he had moved his residence to the hospital until the end of 1975, when he was too sick to see anyone, Joe had met with 63 foreign delegations, which included heads of state, attended 161 meetings, left the hospital 20 times, sometimes just so that Jiang Qing could have a little fun, sometimes for major occasions, like the fourth NPC speech, when he announced the four modernizations. It's not sure if anyone expected this or not, but the national outpouring of grief was unprecedented. In every corner of China, people were visibly affected by Joe's passing, many in a who-can-protect-us-now kind of a way. It's said that when Mao was told about Joe's passing, he was speechless and just stared straight ahead. But his nurse told a source that tears ran down his face that evening as he sat alone in his study hospital bedroom suite well, even in death, Joe and Lai did not stray too far from the principles he always lived by. The main thrust of his funeral instructions were, don't make a big fuss, don't spend a lot of money, no monument, no grave, do not inter his ashes at Babaoshan. He instructed that his ashes be scattered over the rivers and mountains of China. On January 10th, his body lay in state. 40,000 selected guests were permitted to attend the wake. No one was permitted to send flowers, wear armbands, or to exhibit any of the traditional ways that Chinese express grief on these occasions. The next day, the hearse carried Joe's body away to the cemetery for cremation. Then, unannounced, this was pre-internet days, but there were ways in Chinese society to get the word out fast. When that hearse made the 20-mile drive to the cemetery, two million people filed out of their homes and workplaces to line the streets, I'm guessing, Chang'an Road. And they stood there silently as the car passed, but the sound of their grief was deafening. Joe's wishes were carried out. Deng Ying Chao led all the funeral arrangements. True to her husband's demands, Deng Ying Chao never held any party or government positions. She merely served her husband and who knows how many different ways. She was his Abigail Adams or Eleanor Roosevelt. But with her husband gone, she was sort of out of luck as far as a stable income, you know, worthy of her status went. Mao did a nice thing, though, and set her up as a vice chairman of the National People's Congress, which gave Deng Ying Chao enough status and rank to live according to the standards that the widow of Zhou Enlai should have lived. She lived to the ripe old age of 88, passing away in 1992. She got to live to see Deng Xiaoping carry on her late husband's legacy. With Zhou Enlai gone, Deng Xiaoping knew it wouldn't be long. The attacks on him became too difficult to defend without Mao's intervention. On February 3, 1976, to show how out of favor Deng was, Mao had Hua Guofeng named as acting premier to replace Zhou. Jiang Qing was miffed at this. She had been counting on Wang Hongwen getting that post. When Deng saw that he, the obvious choice, and Zhou's chosen successor was not selected to serve as premier, well, that wasn't a good sign. The struggle between the Gang of Four and their allies and those who supported Deng, all the allies of Zhou Enlai, continued on until April 1976, when the April 5th Tiananmen incident went down. Zhou Enlai, even in death, continued to defy Mao. The passing of Zhou Enlai had acted like a catalyst that strengthened the resolve of everyone. By March 1976, more and more you could see all kinds of anti-Jiangqing, anti-Gang of Four posters and graffiti around town that she was openly despised by the people of Beijing. It was a well-known fact. But Mao was dying, and she had to step on the gas if she was going to grab hold of the reins of power. She got her chance on April 5, 1976, the Qingming holiday, grave-sweeping day. For thousands of years, tradition had called for people to go to the graves of their ancestors, burn incense, offer prayers, and sweep the graves. 
Well, people started carrying wreaths and flowers to Tiananmen Square and laying them down at the monument to the heroes. Everything was directed at Zhou Enlai. Grief, love, devotion, respect, and to show defiance as well. A lot of people defied the Gang of Four on that day, and by extension, Chairman Mao. Jiang Qing called in the police and had everything cleared away, but still more came. Over 300,000 people came out to Tiananmen Square that day to vent against Jiang Qing and the Gang of Four and to mourn their fallen premier. So Mao gave the Gang of Four the okay to dump on Deng Xiaoping and blame him for this whole counter-revolutionary action. So just like that, Deng was purged and all his positions of authority were taken from him. But... Once again, Mao stepped in and stayed the hand of Jiang Qing when it came to kicking Deng out of the party. For now, he retained his party membership. So, Deng was out. On May 11th, Mao suffered another in a line of heart attacks that, pretty much from that point forward, put him out of commission. June 26th, Mao had another heart attack. July 6th, Marshal Zhu De passed away. Then, on the morning of July 28th, the ground shook for about 16 seconds. In and around the city of Tangshan, 7.8 on the Richter scale, hundreds of thousands died. Though incapacitated and confined to his bed, Mao felt the ground shake from his bedroom in Zhongnanhai. As a student of Chinese history, surely Mao knew what this natural disaster pretended. Then again, in September, Mao had yet another heart attack, and finally... Just past midnight on September 9th, 1976, Mao Zedong died. And to tie this story up with a nice pretty bow, shortly after Mao's death, Ye Jianying, Li Xianyan, Hua Guofeng, and Wang Dongxing rose to the occasion and had the Gang of Four and all their followers arrested. And this whole 10-year-long parade of madness and destruction came to an end this time with no Chairman Mao to get in the way to keep things going. This year, 2016, marks a half a century since the start of the Cultural Revolution in 1966. I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion about its legacy. As for Zhou Enlai, we saw in these past episodes how he managed to survive the upheaval. From the moment he became politically inspired in 1919 after the May 4th movement, all through his years in France, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Chongqing, on the run with Mao, fighting the Civil War, and finally, after liberation, building the Chinese state and all its institutions, reaching out to world leaders in the name of peace and friendship, and in the process, winning the hearts of all Chinese people. In the end, Mao rewarded Zhou's contribution to China, to the party, and to himself, with 10 years of the worst kind of political persecution, short of imprisonment and death. I sometimes think, what if someone so capable as Zhou Enlai had been allowed to lead the Chinese state without any of the impediments that Mao threw at him? Without the handicap of Chairman Mao and his political machinations, who knows how far Zhou could have taken China? But despite all the challenges from Chairman Mao, the Gang of Four, and all his detractors... Zhou Enlai laid the groundwork for China's embrace of Gaige Kaifang, reform and opening up to the outside world. Much of what you see today in the PRC is the result. So, Zhou Enlai, ladies and gentlemen, not only a great figure in Chinese history, but in world history as well. The debate will go on as to his achievements, his culpability, and enabling Mao's excesses and any other dirt that might be dug up on him. But the record is pretty clear. By any accounts, Zhou Enlai was a rather special world historic figure and human being. Well, that's it for now. Another longer than expected episode. We're in triple overtime here. Hey, Zhou Enlai, he's worth it. This is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you all the very best all the time. And do please consider joining me again, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.